Once an anchor starts to drag, it is difficult to stop. Personnel assigned to anchor watch are required to pay close attention to a sudden change of weather and must report it immediately to the master. They should pay careful attention to weather forecasts. A great advantage of anchoring is that ships can lie at anchor anywhere if there is sufficient room, sheltered from wind and sea, and provided with appropriate depths and good holding ground. Consequently, anchoring is the most convenient and common ship operation due to its simplicity and mobility. To prevent an accident resulting from dragging anchor and loss of anchor and cable, the personnel who engage in anchoring are required to do their jobs with sufficient knowledge of the anchoring system, including the windlass, as well as the necessary skills. In harbours and ports where manoeuvring areas are confined and shallow, there are many navigational restrictions. Therefore, ship operators are required to manoeuvre their vessels in accordance with the environmental situation. Additionally, when the entering and leaving of ports also involves berthing and unberthing operations, ship handling without assistance is not easy. This difficulty is due to the problem of directional control and course keeping, a direct result of poor steerability at low speed and the influence of wind and current. Under such circumstances, ship operators are required to use assistance in ship handling, assistance such as the use of tugs when necessary, in conjunction with their own full understanding of the maneuverability of ships including the ability of rudder deflections to check yaw at low speed and the stopping power of various stages of reverse engine revolutions. In addition to a ship's main engine, rudder and thruster, tugs are used for ship handling assistance in bays and harbours. Tugs are classified by propulsion type as follows. Voigt-Schneider propeller, VSP type, controllable pitch propeller, CPP type, and azimuthing drive propeller, Z type. In Japan, the azimuthing drive propeller type is the predominant tug. Such tugs are equipped with two steerable propulsion units that revolve 360 degrees. By controlling both the direction and revolutions of the propellers, tug assistance for ship handling is available in all directions and with varying thrust. The use of tugs is decided in accordance with ship handling requests such as to control a towed ship's speed, lateral motion, and yaw rate. In pulling out operations, the tug's paid out rope length is reckoned ranging from double to 2.5 times the tug's length, L. As the towed ship's size increases, still longer rope is used. This is the arrangement for assistance in lateral motion control by one tug. It is common to use this arrangement in combination with a bow thruster or with an anchor. This is the arrangement for assistance in lateral motion control by two tugs. This is the arrangement for assistance in pivoting motion control. In the tug operations, either the pushing or pulling method is used. 
The pulling method is needed for broad sea room. This method has the demerit of towing force decrease due to the impact of discharge current, but it has the merit of a flexible use of tugs. When a tug tows the stern of a ship, the ship's pivot point will be aft of the bow, about one-third of the total length of the ship. When the bow is towed, the pivot point will be forward of the stern, about one-third of the ship's length. As the point of action C exerted by the tug moves closer to the ship's centre of gravity G, the pivot point P moves farther from the centre of gravity G. Consequently, turning in a short round requires a circular manoeuvring area with a radius greater than GP plus half of L, with the turning centre at the pivot point P. That is, the farther the point of action from the centre of gravity, the smaller the turning radius. A ship under one knot headway then makes a 90 degree turn with the assistance of a tug pushing either the bow or the stern of the ship. It is known that pushing a beam the stern of a ship causes a relatively large kick out. At the same time, however, it enables the ship to turn in a smaller manoeuvring area than if the ship were pushed a beam the bow. When a tug assists the pivoting motions of a ship under strong wind and current conditions, the operation of towing the bow in the direction of the wind and current requires a broad manoeuvring area due to the ship's increased range of motion. On the other hand, the operation of towing the stern against the wind and current is effective for pivoting in a small area. The ship will be in motion close to turning in a short round. Therefore, close attention should be paid to ship handling in manoeuvring areas with strong currents. In the handling of berthing ships, it is very important to control the ship's approach velocity as well as directional control. As a ship approaches its objective location, its headway should gradually be reduced and the hull inertia should be stopped at the predetermined point. On the assumption that the ship can employ braking power through the use of dead slow astern engine, guidelines for speed reduction schemes for LNG carriers, PCCs and container ships are shown in this graph. This is a guideline for a speed reduction scheme for VLCCs. To prevent damage to the wharf and fenders, a large-sized ship should reduce its headway to zero somewhere at a distance of one ship length or ship breadth from the wharf, and then make a lateral move, berthing with the ship's heading kept parallel to the wharf. Wharfs and shore-based mooring facilities are usually designed assuming a berthing velocity of 15 centimeters per second. Actual berthing velocities are limited, however, and should not exceed 10 centimetres per second for ordinary sized ships and 5 centimetres per second for large sized ships. The function of mooring lines is to control a ship's motions and make the ship fast to a fixed position. Head lines and stern lines are used to control surge, sway and yaw. Spring lines function to control drift. Moreover, since it's desirable that each line be extended as far as possible, it is necessary that attention be paid from above during berthing operations to ensure these maximum lengths. In cases of in-harbour ship handling accompanied by entering or leaving ports, ship handling without assistance is far from easy. In particular, the external force of wind and current 
has a great influence on keeping course and on changing course, on speed control and on the directional control of ships. Taking the influence of external force into consideration, we are requested to implement berthing ship handling with the proper berthing approach angle and velocity, and to use assistance measures such as tugs and bow thrusters for ship handling. In accordance with the request of the industrial world for the rationalization of transporting and procuring expenses, large-sized ships have been developed primarily in bulk carriers and crude oil tankers. In particular, the cost of transportation per voyage has been reduced because wide-beam, very large ships have been placed in commission. Then the remodeling of the stern shape aiming at energy conservation has brought an improvement of propulsive efficiency, gaining the maximum two knots speed increase with the same output power. On the other hand, these very large ships have still more magnified their maneuvering characteristics, viz. good turning ability, but poor course keeping ability. When manoeuvring very large ships, as typified by VLCCs, ship operators are particularly required to grasp exactly the manoeuvrability of their own ships and to establish manoeuvring techniques more than ever, including speed control. To attain the above challenges, let us consider how to deal with the manoeuvrability of very large ships. Good turning ability, stable course keeping ability and good initial turning and or course changing ability are required for ship manoeuvrability. But turning ability and course keeping ability are of countervailing nature to each other. Turning ability is characterized by the radius and the rate of turn on the orbital motion of steady turning phase the former being normalized by the ship length and the latter by the turning speed and or ship length. The initial turning and or course changing ability, hereinafter called initial turning ability, is defined by the change of heading response to a rudder deflection and the yaw damping response when the rudder is deflected to midship. In other words, this ability indicates whether steerability is favourable or not. The course keeping ability is the ability to maintain a straight path with the rudder held midship without applying any counter rudder. The parameter of block coefficient CB is used for comparing fat ships and fine ships. Fine ships with small block coefficient, such as container ships, constitute characteristic features with good initial turning and course keeping abilities, but with poor turning ability. On the other hand, fat ships with large block coefficient, such as tankers and bulk carriers, constitute characteristic features with good turning ability, but with poor initial turning and course keeping abilities. First, let us consider the turning ability. When the rudder is deflected and held at a fixed angle, the turning path of the ship's centre of gravity is called the turning circle. The advance is the distance of the ship's centre of gravity along the original approach course from the start point of rudder deflection to the point where the ship has turned 90 degrees. 
The transfer is the distance from the original approach course to the ship's centre of gravity when it has turned 90 degrees. The maximum advance is the maximum distance of the ship's centre of gravity along the original approach course when the ship has turned a little more than 90 degrees. The tactical diameter is the distance from the approach course to the ship's centre of gravity when it has turned 180 degrees. The maximum transfer is the maximum distance of the ship's centre of gravity from the original approach course. And the final diameter is the diameter of the ship's trajectory when it has settled down to the steady turning motion. The reach is the distance along the original approach course from the origin of rudder deflection to the centre of final diameter. Immediately after the completion of rudder deflection, the ship's centre of gravity and aft terminal are kicked out. The kicked out amount on the centre of gravity is about 1% of the ship length, but that amount on the aft terminal occasionally reaches more than 15% of the ship's length. The tactical diameter, TD, in a water area unaffected by water depth is shown in the figures, with the maximum 35 degree rudder angle. A fat ship, such as a tanker, is approximately three ship lengths, and that of a fine ship, such as a high-speed freighter, is approximately four ship lengths. Let us examine the influence of water depth on the turning circle, taking examples of a 280,000 deadweight ton tanker in full load condition. When turning in a shallow water area, the maximum advance increases approximately up to 1.4 times, and the tactical diameter up to 1.3 times, as compared to the turning in deep water respectively. Sufficient care should be taken for the above when navigating in shallow water straits such as the Malacca Strait. <laughs>